Scott Mason with Holston Gases. In this training module, we're going to talk about the gas tungsten arc welding process, otherwise known as TIG welding. In this training module, we're going to talk about the differences in the TIG torches, basically between a water-cooled torch and an air-cooled torch, and how to properly install the consumables that go in the torch, and a little bit about basic setup of a TIG system. The first item we're going to discuss is the TIG torches. There are two different types of TIG torches, the first type being an air-cooled TIG torch. An air-cooled TIG torch has only one hose coming up to the torch head, and this hose carries the welding current and the shielding gas. This torch, th this torch relies on the shielding gas and the ambient air around the torch to cool the torch. So it's recommended that this torch doesn't exceed 200 amps. If you have an application that's greater than 200 amps, then it would be better off to use a water-cooled TIG torch. Also, you'll see here, this is also an example of an air-cooled TIG torch, although this one has a gas valve on it. The next TIG torch is a water-cooled TIG torch, like we have right here on the left. This water-cooled TIG torch has three hoses coming to it. You'll notice the first hose is black. This hose carries the shielding gas to the TIG torch. Then you have a blue hose, which carries the coolant from the cooler to the TIG torch. Once the coolant comes through the torch, it circulates, taking the heat out of the torch from the welding arc, it's going to send it back out the red hose to the water cooler. Now you'll notice when you look at one of these that the red hose is quite a bit larger than the other two hoses. That's because the copper conductor on the inside is inserted in this red hose and this is what carries the welding current to the TIG torch. So the coolant travels in the blue, circulates around the head of the torch, and is then exits the red hose and removes the heat that's going to be building up on that conductor cable inside that red hose and, and takes it to the cooler. One thing you'll notice with these water-cooled torches, if you ever lose coolant flow, it does not take very long at all for the torch to overheat and start to break down. So it's important that coolant's always flowing uh, in these TIG torches. So that's a little explanation of the different TIG torches that are available today. So now that we've talked about the TIG torch and the connections that go on to the TIG torch, we can follow it back to the welding machine and see where they hook up. So the red cable comes into the output stud, goes through this connection block, and then comes out this red hose and into the inlet down here of the radiator or cooler. The cooler does what it does and it takes the heat out of the coolant and sends the cooled coolant back out to the torch to start the process over again. This is a closed loop. And then we'll have our gas line, which is our shielding gas line, coming out of the black hose and to the torch. Now you'll notice that there is a little cylinder with an arrow indicating that this is the, the shielding gas out, outlet and this is on the outlet of the solenoid valve. And then you'll notice right here, this is our work connection for our work or ground clamp. And then we have our torch lead connection, and it's designated by a little electrode symbol up there. And then this is our 14 pin receptacle where our remote control is hooked. And we have a receiver on here right now for a wireless foot pedal. And you can see it's just a 14 pin connection, just like this right here. And we'll talk about that next. So most TIG applications utilize some type of remote on off control. Here are a couple that are available today in the market. First being the foot control. The foot control has three functions. It'll turn on the gas flow, it'll turn on the welding arc, and also adjust the amperage. So for example, if you have your welding machine set for 100 amps and you push it all the way down, you'll get 100 amps. As you let off, the amperage will decrease back down to zero amps, or whatever the machine scale is. Next is another foot control, but this one uses a receiver that plugs into the output receptacle, the remote receptacle of the power source. And this is a wireless foot control. These are very popular and work very nicely. Next is a hand control. This operates the same way as the foot control, except that all the controls are right here on this thumb wheel. And there's also push button controls where an operator would just push a button and the arc would come on and then he would let go and the arc would go out. Just a simple on off switch. So here's an example of the remote receptacle on a power source and so to install a foot pedal or a thumb control or a remote we would just take the plug connection, mate it with the keyway 
of the 14 pin output receptacle and then simply just screw it on. Now we're ready to start discussing the TIG torch and the consumables that make up the TIG torch. As you can see, there's many different consumables and it can be quite intimidating if you've never installed any of these consumables on a TIG torch before to know the order of operation as to how they're installed. And it's really important to do it correctly, otherwise you could end up with some damaged torches or some parts that don't quite tighten down and that will create heat and cause the torch to possibly pre prematurely fail. So we'll talk about each component from the back to the front. The first component to talk about is the back cap. The back cap screws into the back of the torch and this is actually what holds the excessive length of tungsten, whether you use the whole seven inch piece, a smaller three inch piece, or even one cut down two inches or less so that you can use this smaller back cap, otherwise known as a button. And it's used if the access is uh, tight for the weld joint so that the welder can manipulate the torch around tight joints or seams or pipes uh, while welding. So that's a button back cap and this is just a standard back cap that comes uh, on most TIG torches. Next is the heat shield. The heat shield is installed right on the front of the TIG torch just like so. Okay and it does exactly what it says. It shields the heat from the torch. Okay and then also next we have our collet body. Here's our collet body and the collet body screws directly into the torch and it holds the tungsten. And the collet body should be changed to be the same as the size of the tungsten that you're using. So if you're using an eighth inch tungsten, you should use an eighth inch collet body, okay? Sometimes the collet body can be replaced with what's called a gas lens. If you notice, the gas lens is a little bit wider than the collet body and it has a screen on it. And what this does, this helps the gas flow uh, be less turbulent and gives better coverage over the weld zone and also reduces the amount of shielding gas necessary to properly shield the welding arc. So some folks like using a, a gas lens and some like using a collet body. I'm gonna use a collet body for this demonstration. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to install it, just screw it in hand tight into the threads of the torch. Now on that collet body, the shielding gas flows through it and flows out of these big holes and so does the welding current. So since welding current flows through this part, it's really important to tighten it down really tight. So I'm gonna take my wrench and I'm just gonna snug it down so that I'm sure that it's tight, okay? Once I've done that, then I can install a piece of tungsten. Now to do this, I like to take what's called the collet. This is what uh, tightens to the tungsten and actually makes the electrical connection from the torch to the tungsten. And it's very important that the correct collet is used uh, for the correct size tungsten. So if you're using a 332nd collet, you should be using a 332nd tungsten. And in that case, we are using a 332nd tungsten. So I'm gonna slide it in like so. And then I'm gonna insert it in the back of the torch like this, okay? Now that I have it like this, I can take the back cap and slide it on and screw it into place. But I don't wanna screw it all the way down tight because that way I won't be able to move the tungsten. So now that I have that installed, and I have the back cap slightly backed off, I can adjust the tungsten length. Once I have that done, then I will install the cup or the nozzle. This is made out of ceramic and there are several different types of nozzles. Ceramic is probably the most popular. Anyways, we're gonna install the ceramic nozzle or AKA cup onto the torch like so, okay? So now we gotta decide how far we want the tungsten sticking out of the torch. Most manufacturers say that the tungsten should stick out the diameter of the tungsten outside the nozzle. So for example, if you had an eighth inch tungsten, that means you would have the tungsten extended an eighth inch outside the cup. Now a lot of welders will do kind of whatever they wanna do on this and it's really okay as long as you have adequate shielding gas flow. So if you needed to access a tight joint, then it's okay to stick it out a little bit further, granted you have the appropriate shielding. 
uh, to compensate for the extended stick out. And so once I got the tungsten at the desired stick out, I'm gonna tighten out down the back cap, just finger tight, and that'll lock that tungsten in place to where it won't move. And now it's pretty much ready to weld. Now there are also many different types of nozzles and nozzle sizes. And for example, we have right here, I wanted to show you that this nozzle is quite a bit larger than that nozzle because this one is for a gas lens only and you'll see that it screws onto the outside of the gas lens, okay? However, it can still have the same size outside um, opening on the orifice of the nozzle. And this smaller nozzle is for just a typical collet body. And so to determine the right part number, it's always important to look at the manufacturer of the TIG torches parts breakdowns to ensure that you get the right nozzle for the right gas lens or collet body. And another interesting thing to note here on the, on the uh, cups is the number. See, this is a number seven and this is a number five. What those numbers mean is the size and inches of the outside of the opening of the orifice of the gas nozzle. So for example, this one is a five, so that'd be a five sixteenths. This opening is five sixteenths. This is a seven, so that means that the opening is a seven sixteenths. So that is how you tell the size of the gas nozzle. Now, most folks won't know that, and most folks will just say they want a number five or number six or number seven cup, but that's what it means. And so there's also flow rates that we need to talk about, and flow rates with TIG welding is extremely important, and it's extremely difficult to say in stone what the correct flow rate is for the uh, welding application. It really determines on a lot of different variables, the surrounding environment, the distance that the tungsten is stuck out of the nozzle, whether you're welding on aluminum, whether you're welding on steel, access to the joint, and which size nozzle you're going to use. So the smaller the nozzle, so say we're using a three, four, or five, that might require a flow rate of five to eight cubic feet per hour. And granted, there's no uh, environmental problems such as winds or drafts uh, uh, blowing through the welding area. Um, and it's up to a seven, eight, nine, or 10, you might require up to 18 to 20 cubic feet per hour. Uh, and so it's really important to uh, use the correct flow rate for the application, but too much gas flow can also create turbulence and cause some porosity and welding discontinuities as well. So it's really hard to, to say for sure what the exact flow rate is. Uh, I like to refer to a particular website, uh, CK Worldwide's website. They have a really nice chart, and here below you'll see the uh, web address for that. And that's a good starting point to, uh, to determine the correct flow rate depending on the nozzle size, tungsten size, and amperage, weld, amperage range that you're welding at. But just remember, too much gas flow can be just as bad as not enough gas flow. When talking about the gas tungsten arc welding process, it's important to spend some time talking about the different types of tungstens that are used. Here are a few of the most common tungstens that we sell today. This is a thoriated tungsten designated by a red band. This tungsten is best suited for DC welding applications. Next is a seriated tungsten. This is designated by a gray band, and this tungsten is best suited for advanced AC and DC welding applications. Next is a lanthanated. Lanthanated is well suited for both AC and DC and is designated by a gold band. This tungsten also has some very nice low amperage starting characteristics. And lastly is a pure tungsten designated by a green band. This tungsten has no alloying elements added to it and this tungsten is best suited for AC welding applications such as aluminum welding. Now that you can see that there's different types of tungstens, there's many more than what we discussed here, but these are a few of the most common. There's also different sizes of tungsten, anywhere from 20 thousandths all the way up to quarter inch. So each tungsten has a particular welding amperage that is welding amperage range that it's best suited to weld at. So as an example, a 1 16th tungsten is best suited to weld between 10 and 150 amps. A 3 32nd tungsten is best suited to weld between 60 and 250 amps, and an eighth inch tungsten is best between 100 and 400 amps. So if you were to use a 1 16th inch tungsten at or over 200 amps, you would notice a tungsten would probably melt on you and would become part of the weld metal, and this would not be good. So 
if you were to use, say, an 8-inch tungsten at around 40 amps, you would notice that the, the arc would be very difficult to start and would also be very unstable at those low amperages because of the larger size tungsten at the low amperage range you were trying to use it at. So it's important to use the correct tungsten for the correct application and also the correct size tungsten for the correct application and welding amperage range. Next, we're going to talk about the different types of grind angles and how to grind the tungsten properly. So when discussing tungsten, it's also important to discuss the different grind angles and the proper way to grind the tungsten to the point. So this right here, a lot of guys will do it this way. They'll turn the grinder on and they'll, because this is easier, this will put a nice point on it, but this is incorrect. This makes the grind marks in a cylindrical fashion around the tungsten and will cause an unstable arc. The appropriate way to grind the tungsten is to fashion the tungsten in parallel with the grinding stone. This this provides the best grind angle and also provides the grind marks to be in line with the tungsten. This aids in electron transfer from the end of the tip of the tungsten to the workpiece, providing the most stable arc transfer available. The most common grind angle is between 15 and 30 degrees. This is ideal and it can be very difficult to grind a tungsten manually to this particular parameter. So that's why tungsten grinders are so valuable because they can make repeatable tungsten points time and time again. That concludes this training module on how to set up a gas tungsten arc welding system, understanding the differences in a water-cooled and air-cooled torch, the differences in consumables and how to install them, gas flow rates, and tungsten selection. I hope you have found this training module helpful and informative. Thank you for watching.